Hello, it's so nice to see you and later on to interact with you. And I want to thank Denver and Kelsey and Liz and Humanities Texas because this is delightful to be talking to you today about Alexander Hamilton and basically his plan for uh, developing the U.S. economic system at the sort of first opening of the United States government in 1789. Um, I, I'd like to sort of start out with sort of a takeaway point. And so if you come away with nothing else today, the sort of punchline of the entire presentation is that Hamilton's goal when developing this new economic system that he's putting into place is really to restore and then to maintain the public credit. And that's what everything boils down to. So I will keep returning to that theme over and over today. So before I jump into the details and the sort of nitty gritty about this, I also like to connect my presentation today to bigger themes going on. One of the reasons I do this, and I'm not just doing it for you, I do it with my own students, um, is because my lecture today, you get all bogged down, or you can rather, get all bogged down in these details about finance and economic policy and interest rates and things like that. And I find that that can be off-putting for students or they can get sort of lost in all of that. But if you direct them to sort of keeping their eye on the overarching themes and narratives that are running through the presentation, they also connect up to what's important in the larger early republic. So I put a list of these themes that you can detect in my presentation today on this slide. And you'll notice as I talk through them that these are big themes in the period in general. So there's a nice synergy there. The first theme is the theme of political economy. And what I mean by that is that there is an interconnectedness between what Hamilton wants to do, economically speaking, uh, so his policy, is interconnected with politics, is interconnected with law and the US Constitution. So even if Hamilton has the most brilliant idea about what to do with the US economy, he cannot just act on it unless he's got political support and unless it uh, uh, comports with what the law and in this case the US Constitution allows. So that interconnectedness runs through the presentation for sure. The next big theme is the relationship between the national governments and the state governments and this has a shorthand it's federalism, and this is by far and away my favorite of the themes as a legal historian. I use this theme in absolutely all of my classes because there is no moment in American history from Jamestown to July 16th, 2020, that you can't find this tension between the national government and the state governments, even if it's the British government and her colonies, but that tension is always there. So this is a useful theme. Uh, third on our list is the United States relationship with Great Britain. Now this theme will be less in your face as I talk about Hamilton's economic plan, but it's still present. And mostly because Hamilton wants to use tax revenue raised off of our importing and trading with Great, Brit Great Britain. And in order to have a nice robust trade with Great Britain, you have to be nice to Great Britain. You, don't, you wanna, don't want a trade war or a real war. And so that's sort of always hovering in the background for today. But as you know, in the bigger context of the early Republic, uh, foreign policy and whether we should be friends with France versus Great Britain, whether we should go to war and support or uh, uh, act against the other is a, is a big ever present concern. So that's the, that's the relationship there. Okay, and the final big theme is political factions, and I won't say much more about this because Denver's going to uh, speak to you about this tomorrow. But basically, Alexander Hamilton's economic programs is sort of ground zero for developing the factions that eventually will become econ uh, political parties, rather, in the young United States. So keep those themes in mind. 
And remember that the overarching theme for everything is let's restore and maintain the public credit. So you might be asking yourself, well, gee, Kate Brown, I don't understand why is it that Hamilton has to restore any credit? What, what's the backstory with, with that situation? And for that, we go back to the 1780s because there is considerable economic problems in the 1780s that Hamilton will have to address. Most of them stem from the fact that war is expensive. And in order to fight the Revolutionary War, we have to go into debt. So let's talk a minute about the economic problems of the 1780s. And we'll start with debt because it is immense. War, war is expensive. And when we fight the American Revolution, the, uh, the United States has to go into uh, not only a lot of debt in, total, total, in terms of total number of dollars, but there are different types of debt, different categories of debt that we need to keep track of. So uh, I'm gonna explain the three different tiers of debt that we need to keep our eye on. The first tier of debt is what I like to call foreign national debt. What does that mean? It means that the nation owes, um, uh, will be in debt to foreign creditors who loan us money. Dutch bankers, the French nation, they all loan us money during the Revolutionary War and we as a nation have to pay that back. So that is tier one of the debt. Now in 1789, Alexander Hamilton is going to calculate how much of that debt is outstanding. And he will calculate that that foreign debt will be about $14 million. So we have to keep track of that too. Okay, the second tier of debt is what I call domestic national debt. This is again debt owed by the entire nation, but it is owed to domestic creditors, people here at home. And again, Hamilton at the end of the 1780s will calculate this to be about 40, four zero million dollars. What is this debt coming from? Uh, it's coming from the Continental Congress paying the army, for example, or paying for supplies for the army. That's the domestic national debt. And the final tier of debt that we need to be aware of is domestic state debt. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, wait, that was right. Domestic, because it's domestic creditors, and then the states, not the national government, owes this money back. And Hamilton, at the end of the 1780s, will calculate that to be about $25 million, but it's not owed uniformly across the 13 states. It'll be owed, um, by that point, um, different states will owe different amounts. So in total, then, at the end of the 1780s, we will owe something like $79 million, something around that amount. And that's a lot of money, especially because it's not just the fact that we went into so much debt that's problematic, but that the United States really can't pay it back. And throughout the 1780s, we default on de debt payments, we're late in debt payments, and we are basically bankrupt. So. Hamilton has to clean that up, the fact that there's so much debt and we're basically bankrupt. Now, um, there are other economic problems that sort of are uh, running along with that. Uh, one of them is that during the course of the war, both the Continental Congress as well as the states, because they can't pay for uh, supplies, they start printing money. But the money is not backed by gold and silver. It's just money going out there into the economy and that's not a really good thing to do because when you have too much money out there, the value of that paper money decreases. So you have depreciation of that currency. And then the flip side of that is prices go up. You have inflation of prices. And this all combines with the fact that war disrupts your typical economic exchanges and you have what basically amounts to a recession. So to take stock, we've got Lots of debt that we can't pay back and we're basically bankrupt. We've got paper money that's gone worthless. We've got prices that are soaring and we've got a general economic malaise. And that's what the 1780s is like and Hamilton will have to address that. One more thing 
to mention though, compounding all that I just said, another problem is the Articles of Confederation, which is the United States first constitution. And the Articles of Confederation, the political science behind it is, is one that gives almost all power to the states and, and delegates just little bits here and there of power to the national governments, the Congress. And this is problematic because the Articles of Confederation does not give to the Congress the power to tax, which means that Congress cannot raise revenue, which means that all of that debt that we just incurred on a national level to pay for our independence, it's now, how are you gonna pay it back? Congress can't raise that tax revenue and has to depend on the goodwill of the states, which runs out very quickly, and that's a big old mess. So we have lots of problems going on here. There is light at the end of the tunnel though, and that light is the US Constitution. Because the US Constitution has a different political science behind it. Instead of saying, the states, you have all of the power. The US Constitution is very clear and very careful about creating a national government that is powerful. And the government that the US Constitution creates gives a lot of power to the national government, but importantly, it's not unlimited power. In fact, it is limited by the text of the Constitution, which is why on the slide I have, it's limited and enumerated will be really important to our story. So the US Constitution, in other words, gives the national government a new set of tools to use. And that in and of itself doesn't solve the economic problems, but when wielded by someone who knows how to use the tools, it can. And that someone will be Alexander Hamilton, who will be armed with the toolbox of the US Constitution that includes the power to tax for sure he can then address these economic problems of the 1780s. And so that's where we're headed next. So everybody, please keep in mind that Hamilton's main goal throughout all of the detail I'm about to talk about, Hamilton's main goal is to restore the public credit and then once it's restored, maintain it over time. And that's everything he does is focused on that. And it's how he does it that I think it, it's really helpful to think of his plan, which is big and it's, and it's bold and it's detailed. I think it helps us to think of it as occurring in three phases and, the, and having this three phase approach helps to sort of organize what's going on and where the different parts of the plan fit together. So here are the three phases. I'll lay them out for you before we go into detail. Phase one is going to be the short-term plan. It's the immediate relief. How do we, right in this moment, stop the bleeding, turn the bankruptcy around, and restore the public credit in the here and now? That is phase one. And the two components of it are funding and assumption. And I'll get to that, those details in a second. Then phase three, I go out of order for a reason. Phase three is the long-term looking to the future. We've restored the public credit. How do we maintain it? And along with that, how do we diversify? How do we encourage economic growth? How do we grow the economy and be prosperous? That's phase three. And phase two, which I will discuss with you in detail in the primary source section of our meeting today, is the intermediate phase. And this intermediate phase is, is basically how do you connect the short-term fixes you put into place in phase one with the long-term goals that you are instituting for phase three. And Hamilton's answer to phase two is, let's look to England, let's follow their example of creating a central bank. So that's the plan. Can Hamilton do it? Let's see. So phase one, like I said before, it's the short-term phase. It's the immediate, how do we stop the bleeding right now? 
which is really important because as I just described to you, the 1780s was like a disaster for, you know, economically speaking. So when Hamilton comes onto the scene, he really quickly formulates a plan to fix this short-term immediate restoration of the public credit. And he's got two parts of this plan, funding and assumption. I will talk about each of them. And then after I describe each of them, I'll go back and I will talk about uh, the controversy and the opposition that popped up. So we'll start with funding. When you hear the word funding in relation to Hamilton's economic plan and his plans for developing the US economy, funding means really two things. It means how are you gonna pay down the debt? Like where's that money coming from? And the answer is taxes. And the second thing funding means is refinancing your debts when possible. So let's take the taxing component of this first. As I mentioned on the previous slide, one of the great things about the US Constitution is that it clearly gives the national government clear power to act where appropriate. And the taxing power in the US Constitution is almost uh, unlimited, almost. But for our purposes today, it, it's pretty much unlimited where Congress and Hamilton can propose all sorts of taxes to raise revenue. And in fact, before Hamilton is even installed in the, in the Treasury Secretary position, Congress is already acting on this because everybody knows that we have to tax. Like that is absolutely part of the solution to the bankruptcy problem. And so what Hamilton will do throughout his tenure as uh, Treasury Secretary is he'll be constantly tweaking and proposing taxes. So why don't we raise the tax on this import? And why don't we raise, uh, raise or lower the rate on that import? And so he's sort of constantly meddling with it, but it's all in an effort of raising revenue that can be earmarked when it comes in the door and go to service the interest on all of those millions of dollars of debt. One side note though, uh, the tax revenue is not coming from something like an income tax. It's instead coming from uh, all of the ports of call on the East Coast where um, uh, imported goods are coming into the country and we're levying taxes on those imported goods, they're impost taxes. And it's that tax revenue that is going into the system to fund the debt. So that's where it's coming from. So everyone knows we've got a tax that's not controversial at all. Uh, until the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, the taxing thing is sort of like, we have to do it and all that is good. The refinancing element though of funding is, um, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. So the clearest example I can give to you of the refinancing portion of funding is what Hamilton does with that foreign debt. Remember, he calculates that we owe about $14 million to uh, foreign creditors. And he, as soon as he gets into office, he immediately contacts uh, a bunch of Dutch bankers and he says, hey, uh, can you refinance the loans we owe you and you know, bundle all the money we outstandingly owe and give me a lower interest rate going forward? And that is arranged. The refinancing element of the funding program is all about Hamilton trying to reduce the overall debt cost over time. And that makes sense. But my example I just gave to you was about refinancing the foreign debt. What about all that domestic debt I mentioned? Well, when it comes to domestic debt, Hamilton's plan is that the government will pay back domestic creditors at par value, which means at face value. Uh, it means what the, what the IOU is worth, we will pay it back. But Hamilton is gonna reduce ever so slightly the interest rate that will be owe. And in that sense, he's refinancing the um, domestic debt. Now, if you can see me, and which I think you can, I wanna just hold up, this is, a, this is like a teaching tool I use in my classroom uh, to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about when I say a debt. Because 
there's a variety of different securities floating out there, but, but they basically boil down to something that looks like this. It's an IOU that is owed by the Continental Congress, and it says, at some future date, we will pay you $100, and we will also tack on some interest attached to that. So what Hamilton is trying to do here is he is trying to signal to the marketplace that if you owe, if you have one of these, you're going to get your $100 back. That's what he means by paying this back at par value. You'll get a slightly reduced interest rate, but nobody's going to care because they're just so happy that they're going to get their $100 back plus interest. So, so this is this is actually a really good thing. All right, so what I have just described to you is the components of the funding plan that Hamilton has in mind. But funding does not stand alone. He attaches it to his assumption plan. And for Hamilton, these go hand in hand. You don't have one without the other. So let me now explain to you the assumption plan and Hamilton's reason behind it. And after that, I will go back and I'll talk about all of the controversy and all of the opposition that this phase one plan generates. So when you hear assumption, immediately what you should think of is that $25 million of state debts that Hamilton calculates is outstanding. Because Hamilton is going to argue that the federal government is, should assume responsibility to pay back all of that state debt. That is what assumption is all about. Now you might be asking yourself, and if you're not asking it of yourself, your students will definitely ask it of you. I don't understand. If you're telling me that the nation is bankrupt, and if you're telling me that the tax revenue that could possibly pay it off is just starting, why would Hamilton ever think it was a good idea to add 25 more million dollars onto a pile of money of $54 million that's already owed by the national government. That just seems so crazy. And you're right, and your student is right. It definitely is crazy sounding, but it's actually a really good idea, and here is why. Hamilton has two big reasons for uh, wanting his assumption of state debts to be part of his plan. The first has to do with the administration of the debt. Hamilton is a superb administrator. He's very good. And he knows that when he is in charge, everything will work smoothly. And by everything, I mean when tax revenue comes in, it will be earmarked to go out the door to pay the interest to all of the creditors. And the interest will be paid regularly, in full, on time. That certainty of the schedule, ha Hamilton in charge will guarantee it. But he's not in charge of the 13 states at the moment. And if he's interested in making the public credit the uh, most certain uh, that it can possibly be so that investors will have the highest confidence in the US government, it, it, it's really a knock on his goal here if the 13 different states are doing their own thing and Hamilton can't keep them in line. So, you know, he can do his best at the national level, but if Massachusetts is going to default, let's say, there's nothing he can do. So he wants to assume the state debt so it can all be under his umbrella. And therefore, he can administer the debt, like I said, on time with certainty. And this will go a long way for that sort of investor confidence that he's trying to generate. Okay, so that's reason one. Reason two is that Hamilton is interested clearly in the survival of the national government over the long term. And I, I think that this one is a little bit more difficult conceptually for students to get because they forget that the America that we live in today, which is very powerful and very wealthy, did not exist at all in 1789. And in fact, nobody, not Washington, not Hamilton, not Jefferson, not Madison, nobody knew if this thing was going to work. So the national government is in this really fragile baby state on the, on the international stage. And it's, and it's Hamilton who's thinking, hey, will it help our survival if all creditors, foreign and domestic, 
are interested in getting paid back, which means they're interested in us still being around to pay them back. And the answer to that is, yeah, creditors will be interested. And so in proposing the assumption of state debts, Hamilton is doing this sort of maneuver that will uh, help to ensure the United States survival in its infancy, but also to sort of uh, support and augment its standing and, and even its power to some extent. So that's the logic. Now, I'm a Hamiltonian, so I'm going to say that this is a great idea. But there are plenty of people who did not think that this was a great idea. And uh, so let's talk about the opposition to Hamilton's plan. Okay. First, first step, nobody is concerned about the taxing because everyone knows we need to tax and raise revenue. That's, that's pretty much okay. But James Madison, who is a representative from Virginia, he's the Speaker of the House, and he is um, Hamilton's former ally, uh, he raises an issue when it comes to the proposal to fund the debt um, and pay it back rather at, at par value. And he proposes another scheme. And the scheme is instead of let's pay the person who actually holds the debt in their hands, um, the, the face value, uh, James Madison proposes that the government discriminate against this final holder of the debt and in favor of the original holder of the debt. So, let me unpack what I just said and what James Madison is proposing. To do that though, let's put a pin in our discussion of opposition just for a moment. And we're gonna do like a little, a little sidetrack back in time to understand the history of, or rather the lifespan of this debt, okay? So bear with me here. Let's pretend that it's 1778 and you are a soldier or a, uh, a farmer who supplied the Continental Army with wheat, or you are a widow whose husband died in the Revolutionary War in battle. Well, you are going to be paid with this IOU from the Continental Congress that says, hey, we cannot compensate you now, but at a future date, we'll give you $100 in interest along the way. There you go. So the original holders of this debt, you know, are, are the patriots of the American Revolution. But you know, you know what's gonna come next, right? The Continental Congress can't pay this $100 back. And so 78 turns into 79, turns into 1780, let's say. And in the meantime, you the farmer, you the soldier, you the widow are like, I've got to eat, I've got to feed my family. And all I've got is this, this security here. What can I do with it? I know I can sell it. So you, the original holder of this debt, finds a buyer. And when I'm, when I'm in a classroom, I literally pass this along from the original holder to the next person, the buyer. So it's like different people holding this in their hand. So if I, the original holder of this, want to sell it to me, the buyer, the buyer is going to say, you know what, I will buy the security from you, but I'm not going to pay you face value. I'm not going to pay you $100 because this is risky. I'm not sure the Continental Congress is going to pay this back. And if they ever do, I'm not sure what in what time frame. So I, the buyer, will purchase this debt for you, from you for, let's say, $50. Well, from the perspective of the original holder of the debt, that sounds good because this piece of paper is worthless to them right in this moment, but $50 of cash on hand can buy what they need. So that exchange happens. And now the buyer is, in, is holding on to this debt. Well, over the course of the 1780s, the same transaction happens over and over and over again, buyer to buyer to buyer to buyer to buyer, until finally in let's say 1788 or so, a final buyer, who we will call a speculator, gets their hands on this debt. And the speculator is an interesting person because they had nothing to do with the revolution, but they are willing to invest money in risky investments like this on the off chance that they will receive a big reward. So lots of risk, 
to lots of reward. And it's those final holders of the debt, these speculators who are, are, are holding massive quantities of this debt when Hamilton takes office. And then Hamilton takes office and he says, oh, by the way, uh, if, it doesn't matter what price you bought this at, we are gonna pay you back at $100, it's face value. So that, that means that all of those speculators who bought junk bond, basically, junk debt for let's say $10, will now get $100 when they sell this plus interest. And that's a windfall for this whole class of people who had nothing to do with the revolution but are basically going to profit off of it. And it's that that Madison dislikes. And so Madison proposes that that windfall of profit does not go to the final holder of the debt, the speculator. But instead, the speculator can get something some amount of money, but the rest of the money should go to the original holder of the debt, the patriot, the, the soldier, the farmer, the widow, because they're the ones who actually made the sacrifice. That's discrimination. And Hamilton says, absolutely not, we're not doing that. And again, he's got good reasons. One of the reasons for why discrimination for Hamilton is completely unworkable is the fact that administratively speaking, tracking down all of those buyers to make sure that you know that sort of chain of custody to get back to the original holder, that's, that's gonna take so much work if it can even be done. It's gonna take a lot of administrative manpower, which the little federal government does not have. And Hamilton is like, that is, that is just unworkable. We can't do that. Plus, the discrimination proposal um, it sort of sets aside the sanctity of each of those contracts. Because at every step of the way, when, when I did that life cycle of the debt, there was a, uh, a market transaction that happened and someone got money in exchange for this debt. And so what Madison is basically proposing is to sort of blow that up and say, well, I, I don't care about the fact that there were contracts here in meetings of the mind. And Hamilton is like, that, that, is, that is no way to make uh, creditors and investors feel confident in uh, this young republic. So Hamilton says no to discrimination and he gets his way. But Madison isn't done. Madison has serious reservations about assumption two and uh, Madison will get his way on this one. So Madison will sort of lead the charge uh, among people in Congress who have an anti-federalist mindset, who are suspicious of what's going on with assumption. And the, there's really two main uh, problems they find with the assumption plan. Uh, the first of the problems boils down to state jealousy, I guess, because remember I said in that $25 million of outstanding state debt, it's not equally distributed and so that means that uh, a state like Virginia owes less money in 1789 than a state like South Carolina. And uh, Virginia sees Hamilton's assumption of state debts as, as sort of basically rewarding South Carolina and Massachusetts and any other state who wasn't working diligently to pay down their debt. They're getting a sort of reward for that, that awful behavior. Whereas, whereas Virginia had went into like austerity mode to like tax its citizens, pay it on its head, be a good steward of that debt. And they will be benefiting less for what amounts to good moral behavior. So that's reason number one why there's a lot of opposition to assumption. But reason number two has to do with that, uh, that uh, anti-federalist thought. And there is a real suspicion that to be honest with you, I, I understand why that suspicion is there, that Hamilton's assumption plan is sort of outside the bounds of what the national government should be able to do. And it's, and it's like a manipulation that Hamilton is doing to make the federal government stronger. And you know, maybe that's fine in little doses, but the worry is that this is step one in a slippery slope of Hamiltonian consolidation of power, whereby the national government gets bigger and stronger and consolidates its power, and in doing so, snuffs out 
the power and the authority and the independence of the states, federalism in action, right? A, a real concern. So with all of this concern in mind, uh, Madison is able to block assumption from passing through Congress. And when that happens, Alexander Hamilton is beside himself because he knows that these two things, funding and assumption, they go together. You can't separate them out. And it's at this point in the story when enter Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson uh, realizes that Hamilton is upset. He knows that his friend Madison is the reason why there's this impasse. And he arranges a, a dinner where a deal is brokered. And the deal that's brokered is that Madison will scrounge up some votes to get assumption to pass through Congress. And Hamilton will go to his caucus and get some votes to support moving the capital city from New York, where it currently was, to a temporary home in Philadelphia, and finally to the south, to a swamp on the Potomac, where in fact, it ends up, which is what we affectionately know and love today, Washington, D.C. Um, and that happens. And phase one is complete. And so what remains for us to do is to figure out, well, did it work? Did Hamilton stop the bleeding and turn the bankruptcy around? And the answer is yes. Yes, he did. And we can tell because immediately when funding and assumption go through Congress, the market value of the securities that are like floating around in, in markets, they shoot up to be about par value, which tells you that everybody, investors, everyone knows that these securities are worth something. In fact, they're worth what they say they're worth, which is great. We also know that Hamilton succeeds because during the course of the 1790s, the amount of tax revenue that the federal government is able to raise increases over time. And this is a good thing because the more revenue you have, the more you can earmark it to service your debts. And in fact, what began as a program to just service the interest payments and never pay down the principal of the debt that's owed actually turns into, yeah, we can do both and we can actually pay down the principal owed on this debt. And so, uh, Hamilton can actually, before he leaves office, start to retire the debt. Okay, and the final thing that we should take note of as evidence that Hamilton's plan to restore the public credit phase one worked is that when he left office, the United States credit rating on all of the European markets was as high as it possibly could be, which means that Hamilton succeeded. So phase one success. Yay. But we know that that's not all that he had in mind. So I will briefly now talk about phase three. Very brief. And remember, I'm going to leave phase two, that intermediate phase for our primary source session. But phase three was his long-term plan. Phase three is looking forward and saying, all right, I've restored the public credit. How do we keep this going over time so the United States can always uh, borrow money when she needs to? How do we diversify the economy? How do we grow and prosper? How do we become like England, who is like an economic powerhouse? I want to be like them, Hamilton thinks. And the answer is to encourage manufacturing, to encourage industry. Now, Hamilton is not suggesting that we ditch our agrarian roots. He, he, he's not anti-farming, uh, even though I think some Jeffersonians would like to portray him like that. That's not the case. He is basically arguing, yeah, we have to be um, using our fertile farmland to grow stuff. That's great. But we also need to carve out a large sector of our economy to industrialize because Great Britain is doing it and they are on the right track. They're wealthy. Um, they're producing all this stuff, they're engaging in all this trade, we can do that too. So diversification into manufacturing is what Hamilton has in mind. And he proposes uh, two uh, um, uh, ways to use the federal government to encourage this. The first is tax policy. Uh, Hamilton will suggest that Congress tweak, always tweak, tax rates in order to make let's say imported goods that compete with domestic manufacturers, tax the imported goods at a higher rate, we'd call that a tariff, 
uh, tax it at a higher rate so that an American consumer will say, the English product is more expensive to what is made in America, I'll buy American. Also, you could lower the tax rates on raw materials that are being imported into the United States so that, let's say, uh, a textile manufacturer in New England will pay less for those raw materials imported and therefore overall reduce the costs of the goods that they will sell. Uh, tax policy, that's Hamilton's first uh, um, uh, idea for encouraging manufacturing. His second idea is sort of straightforward. He's like, hey, if we want to encourage textile mills, if we want to encourage the building of turnpikes later on, if we want to encourage the building of railroads, which everybody eventually will be on board with, then let the government subsidize those industry, industries. And he uh, suggests, therefore, his word bounties, but really that amounts to a subsidy um, where the federal government will just say, hey, uh, textile mills, we want to encourage what you're doing. Here is extra capital. Here is a tax break. Here is something to help you along. And this is Hamilton's big idea here to encourage manufacturing. Uh, the reason why we're going to spend just a few minutes talking about this is because it doesn't actually go anywhere in Hamilton's lifetime. This is the phase of Hamilton's plan to develop the U.S. economic system that is, is sort of like the mm, kind of failure in his own time because he just can't, he can't convince Congress to go along with it. Part of it, part of that reason is because he's exhausted his political capital with funding sumption in the bank. But also it, it is always difficult to get the early Republican antebellum Congress to, let's say, support northern textile mills at what seems like at the expense of southern industries. You know, so all of those sort of tensions exist, and it and it makes Hamilton's report on manufacturers sort of dead in the water. But a failure for Hamilton during his term in office does not mean a long-term failure. Hamilton is basically too early in suggesting this. And the, the ideas of tax policy and subsidies are put in place in the 19th century, in the first decades of the 19th century, uh, mostly by the states, but it's still they're, they're using uh, ideas that Hamilton also proposed. So there, there's sort of like a mixed bag story there of success unsuccessful for him, but yes, successful in the long run. And as you all know, by the time we hit the 19th century, we do industrialize. So it does actually happen. So at this point, I will remind you that there's one more phase for us to talk about. It's the intermediate phase that connects us from Hamilton's phase one short-term plan to a phase three long-term plan. And the solution there is the central bank. And when we get to our primary source section, I'll talk all about that and we'll look at the controversy over the bank. So right now, I'll just look forward to your questions and uh, thanks for listening in.